Okay, so we have four more speakers for you today. Uh, the first of which for this afternoon is Alan Chittard from Sacramento, California. Alan is a Google developer expert in web technologies and Angular. His daily mission is to help development teams get started and become fluent with Angular. He provides consulting, coaching, and on-site training to clients all around the world. He is also the organizer of a Google developer group chapter in Sacramento, an international conference speaker, and published author of several video courses. Alan's talk today will introduce what progressive web apps are all about and explain why they are the future for web and mobile development. Everybody give it up for Alan. All right, thank you, Max. So today I'm going to talk about progressive web apps and I'm going to introduce uh, why they are the future for web development. So Max said it pretty much all. Uh, he, he did the intro and, uh, uh, and, and, and talked about quite a few things about myself. There you go, you should be seeing I'm sharing now. So Max said it already. Uh, I'm a Google developer expert in web technologies. More specifically, my focus is on Angular and Google Maps these days. Um, I started working with AngularJS and front-end development a long time ago, back in 2011. And these days, my time is really split about 50-50 between consulting, so web consulting, uh, for clients who are getting started with Angular and, and want to, to learn how to be efficient with web development. And uh, the other half of my time is, is really spent on doing technical training um, with, with my website, angulartraining.com. Um, so that's, you know, speaking about Angular, blogging about it uh, online on, and on-site uh, training as well. And I'm based in Sacramento, California, where I'm the organizer of the GDG Sacramento Meetup Group. So that's me. Now let's get into um, progressive web apps. So the first thing I'm curious to know about is, has anyone ever heard with, uh, about progressive web apps? So if you have heard about that technology before, just uh, Hands up in uh, in the chat. Yeah, I can see a few uh, yeses right now. So that's that's pretty good. Because sometimes when I do that talk, no one has ever heard about it. So that's uh, <laughs> that, that's 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 great. So one term that people are usually more familiar with is responsive web apps, because responsive web apps have been around for uh, longer, I would say, and and the terms of kind of close enough so that people can confuse them from time to time. So responsive web apps are really all about uh, having a web app that works nicely on a mobile device, meaning from a CSS perspective, the code is responsive and is going to fit nicely on your screen. Progressive web apps are more than that, and we're going to get into that in a few minutes. Uh, so a progressive web app is responsive, but it, it is also a lot more than just that. Um, so my next question is, has anyone done a Google or other search engine search over the past 24 hours? So that's, that's a silly question to ask because usually, <laughs> usually when I do that at a conference, everyone in the room raises their hand. We, we all use search engines every day. Um, but the next question is slightly different. Has anyone been to an app store, so Google Play or the Apple Store over the past 24 hours. And so I'm guessing less people would answer yes to that question. Usually it's about 10% of the audience that goes to an app store. And, and I find that surprisingly high because I, I think I would go to an app store maybe once or twice a month. So, <laughs> uh, but, but using Google every day, that, that's for sure to do searches. Um, so these two things are very important uh, in introducing progressive web apps. So what is a progressive web app is my next, uh, is my next uh, big topic. 
So when we build a progressive web app, what we're doing is that we are working on a way to have one code base instead of three. The idea is you build a web app, and that web app is going to be your app that's going to work for the web in a browser and is also going to be what you use on Android and on iOS for mobile devices. So the idea is you write the code just once, and then all of your users, no matter their platform, are going to be, um, are going to be using that same web app. So this is something that's, uh, that's been kind of a dream for, for a long time, to be able to have one code base and then just use that code on any platform and not having to maintain uh, an Android application, an iOS application, and a web application. So PWAs help a lot with that. One of the main things with PWAs is to make that uh, a, a possibility, a reality. So we'll see how, how it, uh, it helps and, and, and what, uh, what are the features that we have available to help with that. Um, the main big thing about PWAs is to reduce friction. And what I mean by friction is that when you go to a store, you have to, well, first go to this app store, then look for an application. You'll be presented with tons of options, usually. So you have to pick which app you actually want to install. And then you're going to install it. And if you're lucky, meaning if you live in a place where you have pretty good network and uh, LTE is, is stable and all of that, then the download is going to happen in a few seconds, minutes, usually seconds. Um, but if you're not that fortunate, which in most of the world is, is really not the case, people are still using 3G uh, in, in a lot of different countries, uh, when you're asked to download 250 megabytes of application code, that is just friction, meaning people can't do that, or it would take forever, and, and they just give up. So regular native apps have that issue that they are huge. They are really huge. And, and, and it can be frustrating from time to time that, you know, um, a common example that happens to me all the time is I have my insurance company, and um, instead of sending me the documents, my proof of insurance, they say, hey, use our app. So I'm like, oh, OK, that's a good idea. I can use an app to do that. If I ever have to need that document, I could use the app and just put it up and, and, and I have the document. Well, the thing is, when you get to download the app, you realize it's at least 50, 100 megabytes of code just to show a PDF to someone. So that's, that's a little bit too much. So regular mobile apps are big, usually, and, and that's an issue. That's, that's a thing that can prevent you from having your application downloaded by users because they don't have the network, they don't have the space on their phone. That, that's also a thing uh, that, that happens very frequently. In the US, people like to get the latest phones and they're fairly up to date and, and, and they have devices with tons of space. But uh, in developing countries, that's not the case. They still have phones that uh, we would have here uh, five, six years ago. So they are, they are more space limited. They, they have all of these um, restrictions that we don't have anymore. So as a result, installing big apps is a problem. And um, if we want to have a, an app that's truly easy to install for everyone, no matter where they are, no matter what their phone is, PWA is, 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 a, is a great option. So the idea is, and it's, it almost sounds too good to be true, uh, when you use a progressive web app, it's win-win it's all over the place in the sense that it's going to be fast for the user. It's going to be an easy experience. They don't have to go to an app store. Uh, and, and, and the download is going to be pretty much painless because what you're giving the user is a web app. So if they know about your web app, it's because they are already displaying it in the browser. And if they're displaying it in the browser, they already have the code downloaded, which means they're all set. Um, so PWA is really using the web technologies and, and, and building upon on top of that to make things uh, even easier uh, for us developers to, to make those apps accessible on all platforms. So this sounds absol absolutely great. I'm going to write my code in HTML, JavaScript, CSS. 
and everyone is going to be able to use it. And I don't have to worry about the app stores. So seems like something that everyone would want, right? <laughs> and, and people wonder, well, is it just a marketing speech that you're doing here, or does this actually exist? Um, PWAs do exist. And one of the most widely used um, PWA is this one. Um, so this is uh, the progressive web app from Starbucks. And when you think about it, a, a business like a coffee shop like Starbucks, they want you to, to be able to use the app to, to order and, and to pay in just a few seconds. So for them, it's really super important that you don't have to download 200 megabytes of code and wait before you can do your order. It has to be instant. So a PWA, from their perspective, makes perfect sense. And, and, and there was a lot of use cases where we just want to, to you know, get this app to show up, do something, and you're done. And you're not going to use it for a, a few days uh, after that. So, so PWAs are fast. And uh, so this one, the one from Starbucks, I'm actually going to show you a quick demo. Because by showing you a demo, I'm going to show you what a progressive web app actually does, uh, what it can do, and what are the different features behind, uh, behind it. So demoing on a phone is, is not easy at a conference because a lot of things can go wrong. So I recorded my screen and I'm playing a video right now. So on my phone, I'm going to Google and I'm going to look for Starbucks. So this brings me to this app. Uh, the Starbucks uh, PWA is, is the one that's going to show up right away. And you can see that at the bottom of my screen, there is this. Um, this kind of uh, pop-up that, uh, that showed up that says, add Starbucks to home screen. So this is the progressive web app prompt that comes from that website. This is a website running in a browser, but now it is prompting me, hey, do you want to install? Do you want to add this to your home screen? So I'm going to accept that. I'm going to say, oh, OK, I, I use Starbucks pretty, pretty often. So I'm going to tap on that banner. And when I do so, I'm going to have a confirmation that's going to show up. There it is. Do you really want to add Starbucks to your home screen? Yes or no. And if I do it, then the install is, is happening in the background. And that install is really just adding a link to my home screen. So now I have the Starbucks logo in there. And that's my PWA installed. So it just happens in one or two seconds because all of the code is already there. And when I tap on it, um, you can see that the Starbucks app shows up again, but the rendering is slightly different than before. Because um, if you look at the top of the screen, there is no browser URL anymore. It, it is now showing up full screen. So I'm not running this in, in Chrome or in any browser anymore. This is the app taking its own entire space, just like a regular native app would do. The banner at to home screen is gone as well. And so I'm going to uh, toggle between different apps so we can see that even more easily. There you go. So now uh, if I use um, uh, the Android application switcher, you can see at the very bottom of my screen that there is a Starbucks app that is showing up. That's my PWA. Uh, with the Starbucks logo and, and the theme, the, the green color, and all of that. Uh, and on top of that, there's my Google Chrome, which, which still has Starbucks open because I went there earlier. Um, but the app is now different. It's now separated from, from a browser, and it's lead, it, it has its own life cycle, really. It, it's as if we took that browser tab and we turned it into its own app. That's, that's really what, what it is doing. Um, and of course, just like any app, you can kill it from here. So I could just close it, close everything, uh, switch between those apps. And you can see that the behavior is really just like a native application. So now, next thing I'm going to do is just close all of my apps. So I just close the PWA. And I'm going to tap back on, on Starbucks. 
And when I do so, I'm going to pause. So I'm going to pause right now. Usually, it's pretty quick, but I wanted to pause so you can see that there is a splash screen showing up with PWAs. So that's another behavior that a progressive web app brings to the table. You can add a splash screen with your logo, your text, your theme, anything you want to customize uh, that splash screen. Usually, it goes away pretty quick because, again, all of the JavaScript, HTML, CSS was already downloaded. So the app just uh, shows up right away and is ready to be used. So from a user perspective, it's great. It's just super fast. You install in one second. You just load the application in one second as well. Um, and and, and that's, that's a great, great thing. So these are the basic features that any progressive web app would have. Um, so installability from, from a browser. So this prompt that's going to say, hey, do you want to, um, do you want to install this PWA on, uh, on, on your device? Then you have this uh, shortcut. It's, it's really a shortcut on your home screen to navigate back to that application. And, uh, uh, and, and, and then you can have some, uh, so we'll get into the more advanced features um, very soon. But the, these are the basic characteristics, using the splash screen, loading full screen, showing up on the home screen of your phone. Once you have that, you have a progressive web app. Um, and what's important to remember is that all of this is just HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. There is no native code here uh, at this point. And I just use basic HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and so did uh, Starbucks for, uh, for their own PWA. So there's more to progressive web apps. We saw the, the basic behavior, but because the idea is to behave like a, a truly native application, uh, progressive web apps can do notifications as well. So you can you know, try to re-engage the user by notifying, um, uh, adding that, that notification. It's going to look and, and feel like a native one. It's just going to behave the same way. So for Starbucks, that could be saying, hey, your order is ready. You can pick it up, pick it up right now, or, or, or that kind of thing. Um, another big feature is offline capability. Uh, by caching data, images, and um, extra JavaScript up front, you can make your PWA work offline. Now, of course, not all apps are, are meant to be working offline, because some of them do require a server. Uh, for for interactions with a with a backend, but if your app if your app has a few features that make sense to make available offline, you can also do that. And uh, finally, you can uninstall. So just like we can install, you can uninstall the app, which is really just going to clear the cache on on the device to remove everything that got installed earlier. So now that we saw what a progressive web app looks like, I'm pretty sure that you want to know how, how do I make one? <laughs> what, is, what is required to, to build a PWA? Because this sounds great. So how do I get started? Um, this is actually the best part of it, because building a PWA is incredibly easy in the sense that you can do it without even writing any code. Um, the, the bare minimum required for a progressive web app uh, is two things. The first one, a manifest file, so a manifest.json, which is really going to be a config of what the PWA should look like. So it's, it's really giving a name to your app, giving an icon, uh, defining how the splash what the splash screen should look like, um, what are what are the colors that you're going to use? The theme, um, all, of, all of these different things. Do so you want your app to show up full screen or just like a regular browser um, application? All of these sort of information. Uh, that's what's going to go into manifest.json. If you have that manifest and you add it to your web app, so in, in your index HTML, you will just have a reference to that manifest.json. Uh, just like you reference uh, external CSS or JavaScript, you would load the manifest JSON. 
And then the browser is going to recognize that. And as the browser sees that manifest, it's, it's just going to enable um, all, of the, all of the features that we just saw. So the install prompt, um, the splash screen, the icon, everything just comes from that manifest. There is an, another second. There is a second thing that is required. So the manifest in itself is going to um, to enable these features. If you, if your app is running on HTTPS, and that's the other very important thing that is absolutely needed. If you want a PWA, you need a certificate on your backend. You need SSL. You need HTTPS. If you just do regular HTTP then the browser is not going to pick up the manifest JSON, and it's not going to enable that behavior. So that's the two things that you need, HTTPS and manifest.json. If you have these two, you have a progressive web app. So this can be done in, in five minutes, really. Uh, we will see a few tools that can actually help generate the manifest JSON. Um, but that, that's, that's all you need. These two things, you have a PWA that can get installed, splash screen, all of that. If you want to get into more advanced features, then you are going to need a service worker. A service worker is a script. So this is JavaScript code that you can set up to do all of the caching. So if you want to do offline with your app, you would write a service worker that is going to specify um, what you want to cache. So this CSS file, this font, these images, uh, these data requests to the backend, all of that I want it to be cached. Um, and, and only the service worker can do that. Same thing for notifications. If you want to, to do the native notification support, it would have to happen uh, through that service worker. Um, because the nice thing with uh, with Service Worker is that it is going to run in your browser, kind of like a background process. You can you can really think of a Service Worker as a script that's always there in the background, and uh, and, and that can send requests to your server even when the user is not um, is not using your application. So that Service Worker could pull your server ask for some info, and then show a notification, even if your app is not actively uh, running in, in the browser. So these are very, very powerful things. And you've, if you're not familiar with the idea of the service worker, I'm pretty sure that you've seen that, uh, you've at least seen one in action recently, because over the past couple of years, it's become very popular for blogs or um, news websites to just to just ask you, hey, do you want to get notifications from us? And if you say yes, then the service worker is going to get there, is going to basically pull the, their backend uh, in the background and send you a notification, hey, we have this new post uh, that showed up, hey, we have this new article uh, ready for you. Uh, and all of those features rely on service worker. So you can use Service Worker without a PWA. It doesn't have to be just for a progressive web app. But usually, progressive web apps are a nice uh, addition. Uh, Service Worker are a nice addition to a progressive web app because of the offline capability and the native notifications. So I mentioned. Um, I mentioned a manifest of JSON, the file that we need to enable progressive web apps. Um, that's an example. That's what it looks like. Um, so again, it's just uh, a, a simple JSON object that has keys and values. And these keys are, um, well, the name of your app, a shorter name, start URL, the kind of display that you want. So here it is set to standalone, which means it's going to show and, and behave like uh, a standalone native app as a background color to use for uh, the splash screen and the header, the description of your app, and then a set of all of the icons that you want to use. So all of uh, you, you can add as many 
uh, sizes uh, and uh, definitions as you want to support uh, ultra high def screens or, or smaller phones as well. And, and that's really the only part that, that's kind of native, uh, having to provide all of these different uh, icons. You, you don't need to provide hundred, hundreds of them, by the way, just one or two can, can do. Uh, it, it really depends on how good you want them to look like on any sort of device. So this manifest JSON um, is, is a config file, really, keys and values. And if you want to create your own, you can use uh, a generator. So there's uh, this one, uh, which comes from Google. So appmanifest.firebaseapp.com. If you go there, you can just enter a bunch of values and then um, click a generate button and you have your manifest.json. So that's, um, that's as easy as it gets. You fill out a form, click a button, and you can download your manifest that you just then include uh, to your index HTML and you're all good to go. You have a progressive web app. So on the side of service workers, in terms of uh, syntax, it can be a little bit more complex because that's where you're gonna have all of the logic that you want to implement if you do pre-caching or uh, while well, caching alone or pre-caching which means fetching data and images up front so that the app would keep working if, if you go offline um, so in that code example we see a, a first block where we define uh, a bunch of urls that we want to pre-cache so here the index html all of the styles and a demo.js and then the service worker is, uh, has its uh, listener code that is going to uh, make sure that everything gets installed. And uh, once the app is ready, add all of the pre-cached URLs and, and, and try to download them and cache them. So writing a service worker can be complex. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with service worker. And in terms of syntax, it can get a little bit uh, tricky which is the reason why there are more and more libraries to help with this. And one of the most popular library used to date for, for this is called Workbox. So Workbox is a library that has all of the, um, let's say shortcuts to help you uh, with the boilerplate that would be needed to write a service worker. So Workbox knows about uh, pre-caching, runtime caching, all of the different strategies that you want to use for caching, such as do I try to get new data every time I'm online or do I just always use the cache? Uh, how often do I want to refresh that data? Once a day, once a month, uh, never? That's, that's up to you. You can define all of these strategies and Workbox uh, enables all of that in a, in a pretty straightforward way. Uh, routing, background sync, debugging, and uh, yeah, basically brings a ton of features on top of service worker to make it easy to to create your own service worker and uh, and and build some features on top of it. So if uh, my example earlier was um, using the Starbucks application. So if we want to take a look at how they've done it, uh, you can go to that website, uh, app.starbucks.com in, in your browser. So I'm using Google Chrome and in Chrome, I opened the DevTools and in the DevTools, I went to the application tab. And in that application tab, you can see that at the top, so top left corner of the DevTools, we have this section where we can click on manifest and that would show us the manifest.json used by, uh, by Starbucks in that case. I can even open this, open this one in a new tab and that shows me exactly what their manifest looks like. So they actually kept it pretty nice and easy, it's fairly straightforward, uh, only two different sort of icons and, um, 
they also added references, links to their uh, other Truly native apps. So there's a link to the iTunes store for the uh, iOS and to the Google Play uh, pla for, for their uh, Android application as well. But uh, yeah, you can see that uh, display standalone, uh, default orientation portrait, the theme color, background color, start URL, the name of the app, and that's it. All of that, all, all you can see on my screen right now uh, is what you need as a manifest to get things started. And even this one is actually a little bit more complex than a, a base manifest. Related applications is not needed. You could really just have a name and an icon and, and that, that would do. So uh, it could be even more basic than this. So in the Chrome DevTools, I can explore the manifest. So these are all of the icons found in the manifest, uh, the different colors and everything. And I can even see the service worker. So there is a, a service worker link up here, uh, which is gonna show me when it was installed. Uh, so last time it was received and is it running or not? I could uh, force to unregister that service worker or force to update it. Um, I can simulate offline from here. So I could click offline and then I would see how this app behaves if I go offline, for instance. And if I want to see the source code, there's a link to the source as well. So if I click on here, I get to the source and I can tell right away that the service worker for Starbucks was built with Workbox because it shows right here and that you're pre-caching a lot of things, such as images, CSS, JavaScript, uh, which makes perfect sense. If, if you want the app to, um, to show up offline uh, without any connection or to be able to, to reload pretty quickly, you would need to cache all of that upfront. So that's, uh, that's how they've done it. And, and they used the Warbox to make this happen. So another feature I mentioned earlier was notifications. So these notifications, um, you, can, you can use them in regular JavaScript these days. So you, you don't need a PWA to do notifications per se, um, but, but it's a, it could be a nice addition to, to your app um, if, if of course these notifications bring value to the user. Um, there was a website that you can use. Uh, so this one up here, uh, is a, a notification generator that shows you all of the options available to play with uh, notifications in a browser. Uh, and, and you'll see that it's, it's, it's actually quite a lot. There's a lot of options here. Uh, you can add icons, you can add actions to, um, to your notification. So buttons like yes, no, or okay, cancel, those sort of things. Um, you can make the notification silent. Uh, you can decide what happens when the notification gets closed as well. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at this website and, and play around with it. Um, try to customize the notifications and then you can click the display button down here and it would show you the notification in. So if you're using a web browser on a PC or laptop, you would see the, um, the native operating system uh, notification rendering for that. If you're using it on your phone, then you would see the, um, uh, the native uh, behavior for your phone in here. And one more tool I want to, uh, to talk about, which is very important when you build a progressive web apps, uh, is Lighthouse. So Lighthouse um, is another tool from Google that you can use to audit your progressive web app. And it can be found in the DevTools of, um, of Google Chrome. So if you go to a web app, you navigate to the audits section, uh, you'll see a, a button perform an audit. And when you run that audit, it is just going to take the app and, and run a bunch of tests on it. 
Um, these tests are, so there's several sections. One of them is PWA. It's also going to test your app for search engine optimization, uh, speed, um, all of these different things that you can think of to make your app better. So if I go to Google Chrome and navigate to audits, oh, I have my app open multiple times, so I have to close that. Yeah, not sure it's going to work here, but that's OK. Uh, yeah, it looks like I have this open in two, diff two many different places, so it's not going to run the report. But that's where you can find it. So in your left tools, you go to edits. This is a lighthouse tool, and it's going to it can run reports on all of these categories. So performance, PWA, best practices, accessibility, and SEO. And the nice part about Lighthouse is that it's going to give you a score on all of these categories. And uh, if you're doing something wrong, it's going to tell you exactly what to do to fix it. So for instance, a common mistake that people make is that their images are too big, uh, way too big. And, um, and, and, and this would catch it and say, oh, this image here is, is like five megabytes. You have to do something with it because it would never load on, on a smartphone or all those sorts of things. So uh, pretty, pretty impressive tool. When you run it, you learn a lot. And it's going to give you great insights about what to do to make your app better. Um, so yeah, from, from a progressive web app perspective, it's going to check your manifests. It's going to check that. Uh, your icons are all good, that your uh, service worker gets installed, and all of these different things. It takes probably a couple of minutes to, to run the audit, uh, but it's definitely worth it. So it saves a lot of uh, time in the long run and gives you a, a ton of info. So the title of my talk was, Are Progressive Web Apps the Future? And um, the thing is, they are, they are still work in progress uh, in a sense that not all browsers support progressive web apps right now. It is getting close to it. Uh, Apple has been a little bit slower in adopting progressive web apps because, well, you, you can really see that as some sort of competition to uh, to iTunes, so it, it's been a little bit slower on uh, Apple's side uh, side to go with uh, with PWAs, but it's it's happening, uh, and and should be there if not already uh, this year. Because the thing is, progressive web apps are a W three C standard, so the app manifest, the service workers, the notifications, everything I talked about. It has to be supported by every single browser. They have to. It's part of the spec. It's part of the W3C uh, standard, um, which means that it, it's, it's going to happen and it's going to become universal support all over the place at some point. Uh, the Starbucks app that I showed you uh, probably started at least two or three years ago. Um, I've been doing this talk for a while. And uh, yeah, I would say two or three years ago. So Progressive Web Apps have been around for, for a few years already. The support is becoming much better over time. And then, and hopefully this year, we'll be able to just use them uh, in any browser and we'll have this, uh, all of these features enable, enabled no matter, uh, no matter which mobile device we're using. You can already find a few directories of PWAs. So there are two examples here, uh, PWA directory dot appspot.com and pwa.rocks. Uh, these ones date from years ago when PWAs got started. So you'll see a, a lot of uh, tiny games or like kind of to-do list examples. And most of them work offline. They do notifications. They do all of these things that I talked about. So if, if you want to play around and, and test a few progressive web apps, that's a great place to go and, uh, and take a look at. All right, that was my last slide. So thanks a lot for your attention. And now if you have any questions, we can, uh, we can get started with a Q&A.
Awesome. Thanks, Alan. No problem. All right, questions. One sec. Come right up. Okay, uh, so we've got, they actually were going like during the talk. So some of these may have been answered already, but just in case, mm -hmm. uh, feel free to gloss over. Um, so up first, uh, is there a specific technique to force uh, PWAs to update when new versions of the application have been deployed on the web? Uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's a very good question because one of the thing with, when we cache data is that we, we want to be able to reset that cache and we want to be able to say, Hey, we have a new version of the application. So, uh, there are techniques and, and workbox does provide support for that, um, where you can basically add a prompt that would tell the user, Hey, we have a new version of the app. Do you want that new version? And then they would accept. And if, well, if they do accept. Uh, you would download the new version of the app, and all of that would be done by your service worker. So if you look at the workbox documentation, they have ways to do this. Um, I, I use Angular a lot, and I know that the Angular integration for progressive web apps does that pretty much automatically. So you can just uh, have that support out of the box for free as well uh, with, with Angular. Um, I never wrote the entire thing from scratch, but it, it's possible to do that too. So there was definitely options to be able to say, hey, I want to reset my service worker, download a new version of the app. And um, and you can either prompt the user or make it automatic. It's it's really up to you. Gotcha. Um, so kind of going, going into that, uh, what is actually downloading when a user starts adding something to the home screen? It, it depends on, on what uh, the service worker for the PWA asks for download. So usually the bare minimum would be the index HTML, um, the JavaScript and the CSS, but uh, the service worker can decide to cache hundreds of images or make some API requests to cache that data uh, in the background. Because the thing with a, a service worker is that it's really a proxy between your browser and the internet. And that proxy decides what to cache and when. So you can decide to just, you know, get tons of data and pre-cache it so that when a user gets to that screen, everything shows up already. So really, in terms of caching, the bare minimum would be HTML, JavaScript, CSS for the current page, but there was no limit in in how much you can, well, there are limits in terms of size uh, of how much you can download up front. But, um, but yeah, depending on your app, you can, you can really get creative and, and download a lot of things uh, up front. Gotcha. So it's at, it's at the app's discretion. Uh, if deleting the app is basically clearing the cache, does that mean that the PWA could be uninstalled via a user cleaning their system cache? Uh, yeah, so if you, if you go to your browser and, uh, and, and clear the cache for, uh, for, for this app, you would lose the service worker, you would lose the data and, and everything associated to it. Uh, the shortcut on your home screen would still be there, but when you tap on it, it would, it would basically trigger a re-download of everything. So uh, you, you can uninstall the app just like you would on a regular phone, so just uh, the way you, you would uninstall an app on Android and iOS just works the same for a PWA. Uh, but yeah, there is this extra uh, thing that a user could go to their cache, clear everything, and they have um, they have a new blank state for their PWA. That, that's a possibility, yeah. Okay. Um, so can PWAs access location services? Uh, if so, how do you write code that works between both iOS and Android platforms? Uh, yeah, that, that's an excellent question. And the thing is, if you look at where the web is going these days, all of the new JavaScript APIs that were released over the past two to three years, they are all about doing exactly that, giving JavaScript access to things that were us usually just for mobile devices. So location, um, uh, accelerometer, uh, orientation of the device, 
um, even Bluetooth. So Bluetooth support is now in JavaScript. You, you can do Bluetooth from your from your PWA in JavaScript. Uh, so all of these things that used to be 100% native, now we have access to that in JavaScript. And, and, and the web is going more and more in that direction. So in the long run, the need for truly native APIs is going to become maybe not zero, but uh, for, for most web, for most PWAs these days or most native apps, I don't think you would really need anything native anymore because JavaScript can do so much. So location, definitely, that's, that's the easy one. Uh, yeah, you can even go with Bluetooth. So with Bluetooth, the sky is the limit, right? You can connect to any device that's Bluetooth enabled and, uh, and, and do a lot. That was actually our, our first talk of the day was about yeah. using the Bluetooth <laughs> API. <laughs> that's, uh, that, that dovetails perfectly. Yeah. Um, so kind of going along the line of, of mobile platforms, uh, have you ever heard of native script? And if so, how do you think of that in contact in contrast to PWAs? Yeah, so a native script, uh, native script is different in the sense that you build a web app using JavaScript, HTML, CSS, but a native script compiler is going to turn that web app into a native Android application and a native iOS application. So there is a compiler, there is a process to to turn your code into native apps which means that you still need to publish that code to the app stores. And um, so, so, so you get your true uh, native apps with native scripts, uh, even if what you're writing is, is JavaScript and, and HTML and CSS. Um, the upside is that if you're familiar with web development, it's pretty easy to get started with native scripts. The downside is you're limited to the components that uh, native script gives you. So in terms of UI, you're going to be restricted to the native, um, uh, let's say, buttons or tabs or UI elements that native script supports for both uh, iOS and Android. So if you want to be truly creative and, 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 and uh, well, you'll be limited in, in that way. Uh, you have to use their own components and APIs to build everything. But it, it's a pretty good solution. I, I like it too. Uh, if you do want these apps in your store, then native script is a great way to go about it. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, is there an approximate limit on initial download size for PWAs? And is this limited? Is this uh, device dependent? Um, so yes and yes. <laughs> And, and that's why there was no there's no easy answer to that because every browser platform is going to have its own limitations. Uh, that said, I've never heard about anyone hitting those limits, so you can you can do a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I've seen apps that would download tons of images. Let's say. In, in, in hundreds of images where on when the application loads and it, it would make that in the background and then never hit the cache limit for uh, for, for for the web app so there's the limit is huge some are advertised so it's, if you look for some info on the browser they would tell you oh there's a limit at uh, let's say 50 MB or 500 MB but some of them are not even enforced and um, and just like everything, well, even if it's restricted, you could decide to um, well to work around that cache by removing your older data, get the new one instead, and 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 basically manage it. But I've never seen anyone hit, hit the limit, so you're you're most likely safe to do it, pretty much anything you want. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Um, is there? Oh, I, you might have already covered this one. Is there a specific technique to force PWAs to update? When new versions of the application have been deployed to the web, yeah. So yeah, that, that, that's uh, that's a question I answered about uh, earlier. So using Warbox, you can uh, you can have that uh, that feature in place that's going to make sure that you don't have any new version. If there is any, ask the user if they want a new version or just update automatically. You have these these two options. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, okay, I think we've got one more question. Um, what would motivate you to move a free app in the App Store to PWAs if you already have a user base for your App Store app? Uh, specifically, since you lose the support of the App Store, 
you lose some advertising? What are some of the kind of this more of a business yeah. question? So the thing is, you don't really have to lose the app store. You can still keep your app in there and have a PWA that does the same thing. So it's not one or the other. You can have both. And, and Starbucks is doing it. They have the PWA and they still have their native apps for the app stores. So you, you don't have to do one or the other. You can have all of it if, if you want to. Um, the main benefit in going with the PWA is discoverability because your app can be found from a Google search. And remember the question I asked at the very beginning was how many of you do a Google search on a daily basis? And that's, that's everyone. Whereas going to a store is something that we do less often. So if you want to, re to reach more people and, and want to be visible to more people, a PWA is going to do that because it's going to show up in search results. And that's, that's a big, big plus. I mean, from a marketing perspective, uh, your reach is a lot bigger. So that's, that would be the main reason. <laughs> I mean, if, if, you, if you're growing a business and want to make sure your app is, is being installed, that would be the number one thing. Yeah. Your app is going to be visible on Google search, which means it's one click away from being downloaded. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, where can we learn more about you or find you on the internet? So on the internet, you can find me on Twitter uh, with my Twitter handle, and uh, I blog on uh, blog.angulartraining.com. So these are the two main places uh, where you can find me online. Excellent. Well, again, thank you so much from all of us at Oklahoma. Uh, it's been a pleasure coming to talk to you more about PWAs, uh, and we'll see you on the flip side. Thank you very no much. Problem. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Bye.